Can you hear me? Um, my name is Richard. Um, I work in Stavanger as a subsea processing engineer uh, in Risavika. And I'm originally from Malaysia. Um, I moved to Norway because of the good weather. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric1 and Eric2, for giving me the best slot in the day, um, <laughs> immediately after lunch. So I'm sure all of you were as excited as I about the sandwiches that we had. <laughs> um, today, I'm going to talk about a uh, slightly different theme. Um, I'm going to focus on subsea processing. I'm going to focus on a particular team in subsea processing, and that's subsea pumping. And, um, I'm quite proud to say uh, that um, Draugen will be the only platform in the world that installs a subsea pump twice. <laughs> I'll give you an overview of um, what a subsea pump looks like. Uh, uh, I, hope, I hope that um, everyone here will be able to find the subsea pump in my presentation. It's not easy to find. Uh, in the midst of all the equipment. Uh, give you a few of the challenges that we've had uh, throughout the project. S standardization, standardization, and standardization. Next, give you an overall view of uh, Shell's view on subsea pumping from a global perspective. Um, Shell does operate in uh, many fields around the world and give you a few of uh, uh, what we think and which direction is it that we are going for the future. <laughs> Shell owns 45% in Draugen. We are very, very committed um, to Draugen. Uh, we are investing heavily in Draugen, uh, who has been serving us well since 1992. And um, together, with our uh, with Avo uh, on top sites, we are making heavy investments on Dragon for uh, future projects and future tie-ins. We are going to install. Oh well, <coughs> we are in the midst of executing a project, a subsea pumping project, and. Um, the technology that we are working on is the helical axial technology that was um, first installed on Draugen in 1992. And we are working on a project right now to install the same technology again on Draugen. Um, if it's one message that I would like to, uh, for you to get away from today is uh, putting subsea pumps in, sub in the sea. It's not anything new, and it's uh, proven by uh, this table that you uh, can see here. And I think this figure here, it's got uh, accumulated 1.2 million running hours. It's a technology that I see someone shaking their head. So you can, you, you can put a discount onto the figure, but still it's definitely more than half a million hours. This was the first installment in 1993. It was by one subsea as well. Um, it was hydraulically driven. Um, unfortunately, um, it was decommissioned and abandoned due to a change in water injection strategy. Let's talk about today. Um, for those who have been paying attention, this is the second time this slide is being shown. <laughs> But uh, the tone's a bit different now because we focus on this small square here. Uh, that's where the sub subsea uh, pumps will be. Um, it's a station, uh, four inlets. Basically, the whole production will run through this platform. We have a project. The project is called the Draugen Infield Project. Um, Throughout the project, um, we did some calculations on flow assurance. And it was a fairly high possibility that, that we would have a hydrate plug had we continued to 
uh, focus on artificial lift based on gas lift. Therefore, the subsea pump became a very attractive uh, base case because it costs a fair amount to uh, remove a hydrate plug. On top of that, with um, pulling a lower back pressure, uh, having a lower back pressure on the wells, we will be able to improve the re ultimate recovery um, from Dragon platform. The uh, parameters are nothing sexy at all. Um, it's not the biggest motor out there. Uh, proven technology, um, the differential pressure that we have, the flows that we have, is nothing sexy as well. So what we went to one subsea and said to them, it was called Framo, two and a half years ago when we placed the order was, give me something standard that is proven in the industry. This is the whole system. What you saw just now was um, this square here that you see, um, covered under a protection structure. Together with a pumping uh, project, you would have uh, multi-phase flow meters, subsea control modules, uh, mixers, splitters, um, two pumps as well, two times 50%. To provide the accessories to run this system, you need a very big container that contains uh, variable speed drives, hydraulic power units, and even its own HVAC as well, and connected through a umbilical. This is the process control module. It's a, it's a big piece of, big piece of quit, kit, um, 250, 260 tons. Um, 20 meters long, 50 meters wide. It's sitting in Bergen right now. We will be commissioning it uh, next month. Um, this is the pump, um, five meters high, uh, 20 tons, 25 tons, uh, 2.3 megawatts. Uh, that's being tested in flat oil in Bergen. So uh, that's my wife. <laughs> Um, this is the station um, with no bits inside, but um, the bits are inside now. So it's a fairly big, um, you can see if you uh, look at the man here and see how big the station is. So it's a fairly, it involves, um, if you could walk away from today, it would be um, putting in a subsea pumping system is, um, is quite uh, comprehensive. It's not just the pump. Um, the pump, it only sits here, it's probably... 10-15% of the system, but in fact, the accessories that go around it is very, very comprehensive. And uh, lots of room for standardization there, not just on the pumps. I'll give you a few on the three major challenges that we've had throughout the project. And then um, hopefully I'll, I'll get some questions and uh, bring about some discussion. Well, not too many because I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> Subsea processing is novel. Um, we have had to use a fair number of specifications. Some, uh, some that teach you how to write a manual, some that teach you how to put text on it, some that teach you how to uh, put the different colors on it. So <laughs> you have to be practical. Um, and being subsea processing, being novel, we've had to use uh, top site specifications as well. Um, up until now, um, well, for this order anyway, we've had to use um, top site pump specifications, API 610. There is no uh, subsea guideline for, for this equipment. Um, how did we mitigate it? We mitigated it by engaging the uh, what we call the technical authorities or technical decision makers at the early stage, active engagement, and dialogue with the vendor. All of the uh, deviations were identified early and they were placed as part of the purchase order, uh, not to be done while the job was going on. So that added a lot of value. Quality. Um, 
we were careful not to have 10 inspection test plans on one equipment. It's important to focus on what is important, what you think is important, and ultimately, at the end of the day, trust as well. Um, we are dealing with a vendor that know what they are doing. It's not a coincidence that they have a million running hours. So uh, we trust the vendor, and we work really, really closely with them to identify the challenges uh, together. And it's important to find the right balance in inspection. Um, as, a, as a practical engineer, um, um, dealing with one sub C, um, the way you uh, speak to them, you approach problems is not the same. Uh, same way you approach a uh, EPC contractor based in Gabon or Sakhalin, for example. So it's a different approach, a different level of trust and different level of competency as well that you are, that you are dealing with. Large number of specifications and standards are time consuming. Uh, it takes time for the vendor to read. It takes time for me to confirm what is, what is acceptable. So we've got to be practical here. When we do have a challenge, um, the first thing that comes to our mind is focus on integrity. Is it safe? Is it going to harm the environment? If not, then we've got to separate the must-haves from the nice to have, and to a certain extent, uh, cost-benefit analysis as well when you, when you are up with a challenge. So right now, I'm going to speak a bit about the Shell Group's engagement, what we have Shell's relationship with subsea boosting. Um, for the past 50, 20 years, This is where we are today on the limits of technology. Um, you have the different pumps out there with their respective envelopes. So um, what we are deploying on Dragon is a proven technology, hence the focus on standardization. This is, um, this is from what I understand, Shell's involvement in boosting, it all started in 1992 when we, when we installed the first uh, subsea multi-phase uh, pump. We worked with Framo to build the uh, high boost machine in the JIP, uh, balanced piston technology. Uh, we worked together with FlowServe to consider a alternative to centrifugal technology, positive displacement. Uh, we work with Nemo, who, um, who with an Italian vendor, to do uh, I think forced uh, forced heat exchanger um, in uh, what, subsea. Draugen is where we are today. Um, Perdido and BC10, we have caisson ESPs as well. Uh, basically, instead of using helical axial pumps, we use uh, ESPs, caisson ESPs. Uh, Wet gas compressor is something that's on our radar screen as well. Um, looking closely, very interested to see what the uh, next step one subsea is taking, and we are quite proud to say we are working with them as well. We're working on the dual boost system, whereby you have a ESP down on the well that you don't push too hard, and at the same time, um, you have the pumps on the mud line. So for example, if you have a well that is extremely deep, you still need the ESPs to bring the oil up to the surface. And from the surface up to the platform, you use mud line pumping, which is uh, the pumps that we are installing on, on Dragon right now. So that's a concept that we are developing uh, as we speak. Next is the way of the future. Um, we, we are going to have fields that require uh, mud line pumping at 3,000 meters deep uh, require 15,000 psi um, using the, uh, some of the proven technology on materials uh, from Christmas trees that have uh, went to 20,000 psi. 
So what does the future hold for us? What's our view on the future? Started in Lufeng, 1997. Um, to the best of my knowledge, these pumps went on for more than 10 years. Troll, Siva, Columba, Jackson Marlow, that's, uh, that's the boss right now with 13,500 PSI. For, um, and I'm quite proud to say that uh, Shell is working towards 15,000 PSI and I think you'll be hearing the newspapers soon um, on, uh, on, a, uh, on the project that we will be uh, working on. There's always a question, how much power can I, can I put inside? Uh, what is proven, what is not proven? So based on the existing technology that is proven, the large number of running hours, uh, I'm quite proud to say we will be pushing the envelope up to um, 3.8 megawatts. So, yeah. Water depth as well. Uh, we will be pushing the envelope up to 3,000 meters and uh, probably not too far off from Yulia. I have to shoot you because we took a photo. <laughs> so what is it that Shell is doing? Um, I think first and foremost, the mechanical guys can say, I have this equipment available. Uh, I can work on this. Why don't you use this? But uh, it's important to take one step back because the decision making to do subsea boosting is not in the hands of mechanical engineers, it's not in the hands of subsea engineers. I'm, I'm sorry to say that it's in the hands of concept engineers, actually. So it's important that we're working on tools that allow us to uh, um, compare um, how attractive um, mud line boosting is compared to riser gas, how attractive ESP is compared to um, gas lift inside the well. So we, we are working on the tools uh, right now as we speak, and I'm quite proud to say all of that is, uh, is being done in Stavanger as, uh, as we speak today. Uh, we are very, very uh, placing lots of importance on standardization. Um, about a year back, um, we had an asset from the UK uh, that was very keen in subsea boosting. Um, the first recommendation that we had was, why don't you use a setup similar to Draugen? Then that way, you don't have to go through all the hassle that we have gone through. So standardization and replication. The industry has taken a very positive step, and I'm quite proud to say Shell has embraced this step um, actively. Uh, we screen technology using API 17N. So when I speak to a vendor, um, everyone knows what this standard uh, requires. Everyone is based, everyone is mapping the technology using the same standard. Hence, we are talking from the same, uh, at least using the same language when we speak to each other. Um, we will be moving towards 15,000 PSI systems, high temperature and high boost. And uh, we have established a subsea processing skill pool. Uh, quite proud to say the, uh, the first in Shell. So uh, we had a colleague here who's mentioned that it's important to uh, get engineers from the traditional SPS to subsea processing. But the other aspect that uh, we have done is, uh, especially on subsea processing, is to bring top site engineers to come work in subsea processing. And uh, I'm, I'm an example of a top sites rotating equipment engineer who has, uh, who has jumped into the water. Um, and uh, for sh as far as Shell is concerned, the, um, the Risa Vika office is a deep water center of excellence in Stavanger. So that's what we do. Uh, we support our colleagues around the world, um, Bonga, Garnet, Gulf of Mexico, uh, Asia as well, active screening. Uh, we have a project that's going on as we speak, uh, executing it. And at the same time, we will be supporting uh, 
global projects as well. So we are not only replicating equipment, but we are replicating personnel as well. So I'm not allowed to change jobs <laughs> for the next five years. With that, I end my presentation. Um, any questions from the floor? Thank you, Richard. Is there any questions for Richard? Thank you, Richard. And uh, my question is, uh, what are the main challenges of m in maintenance for the subsea pump? And uh, if you can briefly say for uh, production strategy, it, it could go, I mean, it could deviate from, from what you do, from mm -hmm. process. But reflecting the reservoir engineering, w if some deviation in maintenance or operation of the pump would take mm. place, for example, how mm. this would reflect the, the, I would say, the recovery factor or mm. the, the displacement, finally. Yeah. So that's a very, very valid question. That's a very good question that uh, my boss has asked me. So I think you're on the right track, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, we have the opportunity to operate on the bypass. So bypass, 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 if the pumps don't work. Uh, if one pump breaks down, uh, these are two pumps operating in parallel, so you can still have 70% of production. And uh, I think just in terms of uh, difference compared to top sites is uh, in sub well, our philosophy anyway. Um, as long as there is no uh, damage to integrity, HSE and to the environment, um, our focus is to uh, run the machine and there's no reason for you to stop the machine until it stops. <laughs> so, uh, because the cost of intervention is high. So that's the, uh, that's the philosophy that we, that we have. So bypass and, um, yeah. So it's more or less per performance based. If as long as it's working, then you don't have to do any maintenance or it's... Uh, if it's, if it's, if it's, um, if it's, if you run until it stops, then it's not performance-based anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you would accept some deviations with regards to performance uh, because production is more important than making sure it optimates at op operates at the optimal point. <laughs> and for, for the second part, if you can touch it a bit in mm. terms of the production rates, because the injection system is the, is the pivotal. Is mm. the, the reason why we inject water is to to boost up the reservoir pressure. Mm. And so um, the flows that we have on this machine is um, um, approximately 800 to 900 uh, meters cubed per hour. Um, we do not re-inject the water. The water is being sent uh, up onto the platform for processing. So uh, a certain amount of it is oil, of course. So um, yeah, I'm not quite sure if I answered your question, but um, that's the flows and the DBs that you have across the machine. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question over here. Yeah, hi. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. I was at a subsea forum two weeks ago with FMC, and there's been a lot of interest over the years in subsea processing. But they made an observation, but actually there's been very few projects that have emerged, like three a year globally or something. It just isn't happening. Would you have any observations on why subsea processing and pumping just hasn't yet taken off in the industry? I think it has taken off in, I think it has taken off in with some manufacturers, but not all the manufacturers. So I think that's one observation. That's one clear observation. Um, this is my personal view. This is not Shell's view. This is not Stavanger's view. Um, I think it's very important for, uh, for the concept engineers and front-end engineers to understand that this is a tool that is available. Uh, this is a tool that works with the large number of running hours uh, that you see. And it needs to be evaluated on a fair basis against riser gas lift and uh, gas lift when you have uh, 
from, from the wells. So to the best of my knowledge, okay, I have not seen, I, do, I feel that um, there isn't much, uh, s there, there is still some discomfort with it, number one, and I don't think the people are given the right tools to justify uh, the attractiveness of such a system. Hence, that's one thing that, um, that I've been working on. Um, um, William Bucker, for example, like, uh, we've had meetings with him to see what, what we can do. But um, yeah, so uh, that's what, we're, that's what we're, we're working on on a, on a global basis. So um, maybe um, IPSM tooling is something that we're looking at right now. Thank you. Any more questions? Time for one more. Leonid Shulkin, Exxon Mobil. Uh, a question about standardization uh, initiative that you're pursuing. So for the pumping systems, what uh, areas you believe can be standardized, considering that there are so few of these things around the world? What are the areas that are kind of ripe for standardization? I think let's not think about the sexy projects, the big three megawatt projects, the 150 degrees Celsius, the, um, the big palms, deep water. I, I, I really think that, I really think that um, if we can get these systems to economical price um, for things below 5,000 uh, 5, PSI, uh, fairly low boost, uh, low boost applications whereby the technology is proven. I think there is room to uh, room to uh, optimize on that. Uh, for example, maybe you can put a pump on the Christmas tree, then that way you don't have a uh, protection structure to think of um, less equipment. Um, this equipment has been designed with a recycle line, so maybe we could do away with a recycle line and. Uh, live with less flexibility. So, um, so the answer is low temperature, low boost, uh, low PSI rating on these systems. I think there is uh, opportunity right there, uh, out there. And I think that um, uh, if we can get the price of these systems to be economical, um, I think there is uh, quite a big demand uh, out there. But um, that's the intention, so that's something that we are uh, we, uh, lo looking to work on. Thank you. Then we say thank you to Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Press it for you. Uh, I think most of you are HSE engineers, so um, when you ask the question, to the concept engineers, have you have you put your barriers in place? Then, after they answer your quest, after they have answered that question, it would be nice if you ask the next question: Have you considered subsea boosting? <laughs> <laughs>